And the uh, final speaker in this morning's session is Professor Jens Norskov, who's uh, currently a professor of chemical engineering at Stanford and photon science at SLAC, also director of the SUNCAT Center for Interfacial Science and Catalysis. Uh, he has a rich history in, in studying uh, the theory of both electrochemical and chemical reactions on uh, various surfaces, and I think in the past four or five years has turned a lot of attention to CO2 and CO reduction on metal surfaces. So, Jens. I'll be talking about uh, some work that is starting out in, in, in the realm of GSEP uh, uh, in a collaboration uh, between the group of uh, Tom Jaramillo, Stacy Bent, and uh, Anders Nilsson, and uh, my theory group. And we're trying to see if we can couple theory and experiment in a, in a, in a productive way to find new ways of reducing CO2 and, and uh, CO. Um, OK, so just you've had most of the motivation already, and I'll, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, with these uh, arguing again. But if you perhaps you can see up here in the upper left corner, if you look at energy density, then uh, gasoline is out here, very high energy density, diesel even higher, and down here you have batteries and uh, you have hydrogen here. Um, but if you can make alcohols, methanol is here, but higher alcohols, ethanol and even higher alcohols are even better. They also have the higher alcohols also have the big advantage that you can mix them directly into, into gasoline and uh, you can uh, you can uh, immediately use it in the current infrastructure. So making ethanol is a very desirable thing. Now, as um, Matt Cannon said in the beginning, there are two ways you can imagine doing this in a sustainable fashion. You can either have a direct electrochemical reduction of, say, carbon dioxide to make, and I'll take ethanol as the desired product now, or you can first make hydrogen, and then you can make ethanol. I, I know there's a water missing there, but uh, that's how it came out. And um, the first part, the electrolysis of, of uh, water to make hydrogen, is actually pretty far along. It's, we're not totally there yet, but you just heard about it. It is actually coming along. So if we had a good way of making higher alcohols from hydrogen and CO and CO2, then uh, we would be in business. And usually people say, yeah, we, we've got it. But actually, there is not a catalyst for this process. There is no viable catalyst in existence that can do this. Quite amazing. We can make methanol. We can make methane, hydrocarbons. But we cannot make ethanol and higher alcohols. So that's what we set out to first figure out what is the problem and then see if we can find ways around it. So that's uh, what I'll be talking about here. Um, and uh, here's the first problem. If you want to understand something like taking just the simplest possible CO and hydrogen and make ethanol, and you include the possibility that you may also make hydrocarbons, just methane, or methanol, then these are, each line here is a reaction pathway, possible reaction pathway. And this poses the first big question to anybody who thinks about catalysis in general. It's, it's usually not addressed, but it's certainly a problem we should pose. How do we figure this out? I mean, how do we even think about this? And um, we, we, uh, we have been working for a long time on, on, on trying to understand that. And, and we have actually found ways now to, to zoom in on the most important pathways. It's not one, it's several, but the most important that, uh, that uh, we can find. And I'll get to in a moment how we can do that. But it, we, we are actually able to take a scheme like this and make it into a scheme like this, which is uh, still complicated, but now getting more manageable. Still poses questions. So let's just take that scheme, or a scheme like that, actually. It's not exactly that, that, that scheme. And then look at all the processes that we will now include making methane, methanol, and ethanol from hydrogen 
and carbon monoxide. And it turns out, they're written here, there are 51 elementary steps and you have an activation barrier for each step and you have a reaction energy for each step. So there are of the order 100 different energy parameters that determine the activity of one given catalyst. So even with the reduction that I showed, we still have a totally impossible problem to work on. I mean, nobody can think, well, perhaps a particle physicist can think in 100 dimensions, but <laughs> poor chemists cannot. <laughs> so we still need to figure out how do we think about a problem like this? How, how can we make sense out of this? And, and, and one of the discoveries that uh, we have made over the last few years is that there are all these so-called scaling relations. That is, it looks as if all these transition states and all these intermediates are very different, but in reality, they're not. So in all the chemistry I'm talking about, everything that we can make binds to the surface through a carbon atom or an oxygen atom. And that bond is actually something that you can transfer from one uh, intermediate to another from one transition state to another. What it means is that if we look at bond energies or transition state energies for different catalysts, each point here is now one catalyst that we have looked at theoretically. Then what we find is that each of these scale with some linear combination of the carbon and the oxygen bond energy to the surface. So in reality, what looked like terribly complicated stuff is actually much simpler, but only once you realize that you have all these relationships. And this, by the way, was something that had to wait for accurate enough uh, computational methods to get along because you could never actually map this out experimentally. It's just simply too complicated. We can benchmark against the experiment for certain points, but we need to have big computers to actually map out things like this. This is where we are. This, by the way, is the same thing we use to actually reduce this enormous number of pathways to a few because we can use the same technology there. Now, so now we have only two parameters and now we can begin to think about how we do this. I should say, by the way, that what, what I'm looking at now are, are catalysts with lots of steps because steps are the most active parts of, of any solid catalyst. And, uh, these are maps now of activity. Let's look here. This is now a color map. Red means high rate, blue means no rate, and uh, it's plotted as a function of the carbon binding energy and the oxygen binding energy to the surface. And uh, I put different elemental metal catalysts on here including an uncertainty in, in how we calculate this. So you can see that we, we certainly have a sufficient accuracy to uh, say things here. And you can see that copper is probably the best, all those, these lo also look pretty good. But now you all on only have to go here. This is the same map, but for making methane. And now you see all those over here, they're very close to the top of the methane map. And that means they make a lot of methane and very, very little methanol. Only copper is actually a decent methanol catalyst, and that is what is used today in industry. Actually, you add a little bit of zinc, and what zinc does is it binds oxygen a little stronger, so you move down here. Makes sense, right? You can actually see in this very, very simple scheme, you can actually rationalize 100 years of empirical work in a, in a very, very simple way. These are, by the way, the best catalysts for making methane. This here is making ethanol. And you can see that it doesn't look too good. In fact, over here is, the, is a combination of these where we now ask the question, what is the primary product in this map? And let me just blow it up here. So green, the primary product is methanol. And you see copper is prominently there. So silver and gold, but silver and gold only make methanol, but they don't ma make very much of it, so hopeless. Over here, you make hydrocarbons. And this red region here, this is the only region where stepped surfaces will make ethanol, according to this model. And 
there are no elemental metals in that region. Now, why is it such a narrow region? Well, it's actually quite simple. You take carbon monoxide. You could actually start with carbon dioxide. It, it, it doesn't matter. The first step is, is easy. You start with carbon monoxide. And if you want to make ethanol, then half of the CO should dissociate and the other half should not. Right? Then you have carbon and CO that you can combine to form ethanol. So you have to be in a, in a range where you're just at the border of being able to dissociate CO, but don't do it too much. That's actually asking a lot. That's asking a very, very much. And that's the problem here. There are, here's a blow up. There are actually alloys that get into this interesting region. And, the, but, and uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But you will notice it's sort of pale red. So it, actually, even the theory here suggests that it should be decent, but not, not terribly good. But it's still worth going after. And uh, in the experimental group of, uh, of uh, Tom Jaramillo, John Snyder is the main person. He sits down here, so he can answer any difficult questions. Um, <laughs> they have actually uh, managed to make uh, cobalt copper, that was one of the alloys there, man nanoparticles, um, in a fashion where you can see directly in, in the XRD spectrum that you have a lattice constant mid between cobalt and copper. So by Weygaard's law, you can figure out where you are. And uh, they can characterize this. They can uh, put it into a reactor. What, what happened to the reactor? Interesting. Anyhow, there was a picture of the reactor. I, I don't know where that went. Um, but the, the point is that green is what we want. That's C2 um, oxygenates. And we can actually get to something like 13, 15% of ethanol coming out of the reactor, which is not bad, actually. That's pretty good. You would really like it larger. And uh, one of the problems that has been identified is that there seems to be a problem with the stability of this binary alloy such that you get some segregation. You can see this sharp peak shifts into, into two uh, peaks uh, when you, uh, after you have run it for a while. So there's a lot of work to be done here to optimize this. Now, this really points to perhaps finding other avenues as well, because it was su such a narrow sliver of possibilities that we had there. So what are other possibilities? Well, let, let me um, get to that in a second, but just to uh, get to a small point here, which is uh, that if, if you um, read the literature, then, uh, and here is a summary of 18 references in the literature, there are some suggestions that you uh, can use rhodium to make ethanol. Now, uh, there's not agreement about how much road, uh, ethanol you make in the literature, as you can see there. It's actually a shocking amount of scatter. And I'll get to that in a moment. And of course, our prediction was that rhodium shouldn't work. So do we have a problem? So what we did was um, we analyzed not just the step surface, but also uh, the facets of rhodium. Could there be something going on there? And uh, I, I don't want to bore you. This is just to show how terribly complicated it is and how it needs a, a, a brilliant student like H.A. Uh, Medford here to, to do it. Um, let me just summarize it here. So you take all the barriers uh, and put it into a kinetic model, and then you try to calculate what should come out. And uh, if you do this for the steps, 211 is just a step surface, then you should make only methane. That's what the map shows. And actually, rhodium is a brilliant methane catalyst. Let me just say that. It's way too expensive, of course. If you go to the, um, to the uh, uh, flat part of the surface, you should make acid aldehyde, according to this. And the rate should be of the order five orders of magnitude lower than at the step. 
OK, experiments are needed. So these are experiments now in the uh, group of uh, Stacy Bent. Nora Yang here has done the experiments only. And uh, what they did was they prepared a number of different, here are seven, I think, uh, different rhodium catalysts on, on silica. And I will see this scatter that you saw before. I mean, it's, I think reprodu irreproducible is a strong word, but uh, there seemed to be a strong dependence on how you exactly prepare it. That's what you see here. Now, what we want is the red. The red here is the, the uh, well, actually, the red and the blue. F first of all, let me just say, there's no ethanol made, as predicted, by the way. But what is made is uh, acetaldehyde, and you actually saw that. That was what uh, theory also said you should get out. So first of all, you make a lot of acetaldehyde, but that's good enough. I mean, if we can make acetaldehyde, we can hydrogenate that to, to ethanol. That's not a problem. Uh, but you also see huge variations. This here is a, these two are the same catalysts, I believe, but one is not washed, NW, whereas W means that it's been washed. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a, 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 a very, very fine distinction here. And uh, so let me just first address this question of whether you make acetaldehyde or ethanol. And this here shows a washed sample and then if you have a little bit of iron in, then you begin to make ethanol. So the iron helps with the last hydrogenation step. So most probably the spread that you see in, in the experimental data are related to the purity of your synthesis method or your raw materials, number one. Now comes this question of the whether you make the C2 oxygenate or the, the um, uh, methane. And uh, let me just get back here. So if you have steps present, you're going to make methane, and at a very high rate. If you don't have steps, then you can actually have a high selectivity for the oxygenate, actually close to 100%. So imagine that you can block the steps. You can engineer your nanoparticles such that you don't have steps, but only the plat part, then you're in business. So let's see if that works. So first of all, if this is right, then there should be an inverse relationship between rate and selectivity. High rate means that you have lots of steps because they're very much more active, but they also make methane. Low rate should correspond to high selectivity. Let's check it. But before doing that, let me just point out that if this is right, then of course we really need to find strategies for engineering the surface of these. And this is what we'll be spending the next uh, couple of years doing, uh, funded by, by uh, GSET. But I'll just show you some preliminary results. The first here is this question of, now here are now the, all the experimental data but now plot it such that you have selectivity up here and you have rate over here. And you see, indeed, we do see an inverse relationship, as you would expect. So this at least suggests that our hypothesis is right. It doesn't prove it, but it suggests it. But of course, proof will be when we can start engineering uh, things there. And the, the first step has been taken. So Noya has been adding a little bit of the of, uh, of uh, sodium, the point is we know actually from experiments and calculations that sodium or, ox or uh, sodium oxide actually tends to bind along steps. And uh, here is actually they are the uh, the uh, solid black uh, triangles here. You can actually do that. You can actually take a catalyst that had more steps, and you can add this uh, sodium to it, and you can move up on the selectivity curve. So I think this uh, holds some promise. It will take a level of engineering of the surface of a catalyst that is well beyond what is done today, because today it's a lot of shake and bake uh, chemistry that goes into making catalysts. We need to be much, much better at engineering the surface in a very particular way. 
and do it in a scalable fashion. So that's uh, what we will be working on in, uh, in uh, the next years. Let me uh, thank some of the initial work has been funded by uh, DOE and uh, GSEP is stepping in now and funding uh, part of this here. And uh, let me again point to the people who have been involved in, in the work that I've been uh, talking about here. And uh, thank you for your attention. Time for questions for Jens. Yeah, there's a great question. I was just going to ask you about the Substitute. So instead of producing MTBE, the intent was to produce a range of mixed alcohols. Mm -hmm. And in that race, the best catalyst in the 90s was rhodium with molybdenum promotion on mm -hmm. alumina, mm -hmm. uh, better than silica or better than sodium. Yeah. So just wondering if you had any insights. Um, I, we, we have not looked at it, but let me venture a, uh, a guess here. My guess is that the molybdenum is actually oxidized, it's a molybdenum oxide, and that it blocks steps on the rhodium catalyst. That's my guess. So, but I think what we need to do is to get a much more systematic approach to this, but that's exactly the, the kind of thing. I'm sure there's a lot of empirical information out there um, that, that uh, you know, is very hard to rationalize if you just think of it as, uh, as a rhodium on molybdenum oxide on alumina, but if you start thinking about how these oxides and the rhodium interact, then perhaps uh, it can all make sense. And perhaps we can get even better ways of, of uh, doing this, and in particular, get away from rhodium. Question over here. I wonder about the possibility of using natural compounds, like mineral compounds that for some reason have already come together, um, if that might actually turn out to be productive. Yeah, I mean, I, I think any, Anybody who has uh, uh, ways of either finding or synthesizing these very engineered systems, uh, I think all, all ideas are needed here because, as, as I said, as, and illustrated, I think, by the rhodium, molybdenum, alumina uh, uh, situation, there's a lot of, you, you know, catalysts today are mainly made by you, you mix some oxide, you pr precipitate, or, or, and then you reduce it out, and you don't have any control of really what, what happens. Very, very little. I mean, you hope thermodynamics will help you, but the fact that these different catalysts look so different suggests that uh, it's not just thermodynamics, it's actually also the way you get there. So a lot of this is studying how you get there. How do you get to the, to the, uh, to the uh, desired product? Following question to that. Yeah. So, in natural mineral commodities, you know, we're able to we're able to isolate and say, okay, here's a bunch of this mineral, here's a bunch of that mineral, here's a bunch of that mineral, mm -hmm. and then you could work backwards, you could reverse engineer it to find out how it got there. But you know, you you could basically just just by experiment, by trial and error, or by analyzing the mo modeling what's, you know, with the structure that we know about in those minerals. I wonder if you could do something with that. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do think it's an interesting avenue. What I'm hoping for is that ALD methods, like we just heard about, and, and other more precise methods could actually be uh, used to really do this in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a more controlled fashion. And that's what Stacey Bent for instance, is doing and, 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 and will be pursuing here. But I think any way you can find to do this is great. I have a, just a question. So is it, do I understand you right that it's not possible to have a rhodium catalyst that's both selective and highly active? Well, that, that's, that's a good question. And, and, and I think it's going to be difficult. But what, what you can also do is you may also play another trick, which we are also looking at, is if you could make the, the um, uh, facets a little more active. Probably you shouldn't use rhodium. 
probably you should use something a little more reactive and probably you should promote it to get the CO dissociation a little better. But so, you mean alloying with rhodium or you mean just yes, no rhodium? Okay. No, no, no rhodium. I mean, I think any good solution will have no rhodium. I okay, so a, a rhodium containing active catalyst, you're saying that the active component is probably not rhodium if it, if it I, exceeds I, w the I would say the active, if it's rhodium containing, it is probably rhodium, but I, I would like to avoid rhodium. Okay. But I also think that if we need to get to a higher activity, then we need something more reactive than rhodium or we need to promote the rhodium or something like rhodium. Okay. And uh, nickel, for instance, is very, very close to rhodium in, in, in reactivity. The problem is that it makes carbonyl, so you have lots of uh, other issues. But, uh, another question. I thought I saw in Stacy's yeah. data that uh, there were some C2 hydrocarbons made. Uh, a couple of questions. First yeah. off, what C2s were made? I, I, set, I don't know. But no, I yeah. guess the other thing is you're, the, the calculations really didn't address C, uh, C2s. No. Uh, you're and, and other hydrocarbons. So take the last thing. I, I can I can uh, answer that. Uh, no, we did not include that. Uh, but but obviously, we do know that as you move further to the left in the periodic table, you do make more and more C two pluses. So uh, that's just that would have made the first diagram even more hairy. I tell you, but uh, it, 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 it it it's it's possible. Uh, the other question, do you know, Noya? Which, which uh, hydrocarbons are made? Um, so, so usually for um, unpromoted rhodium, uh, I can get about, you know, around 8%, uh, maybe higher hydrocarbons, but those are mainly C2, C3, and C4. It's ethane, ethylene, uh, propane, a problem, but those are uh, just a very low amount. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. She did all the experiments. So. Um, so when you're trying to make C1, that's very straightforward. It's right over here. Ah, C1. Yeah. Good. Yes. That's very straightforward. Uh, but then when you start to uh, want to make C2s, now you're doing a carbon-carbon coupling. Yeah. And. So what's to stop it at C2? Why not just add another carbon, another carbon, another carbon? And in the old literature, of course, there's, you make the catalyst to try to make, get away from methane to make fuels, liquids, higher hydrocarbons. You end up with a distribution of products, yep. fluorine polymerization distribution. Mm -hmm. And um, what does your modeling tell you about that? How are you going to stop at C2? Yeah, I mean, the, let, me, let me distinguish between two, two uh, different categories. What it really means is two different set of reaction conditions. If you want to make hydrocarbons, then the Fischer-Tropsch chemistry that, that you're talking about has exactly that problem, that it's very, very hard to control. Once you start polymerizing, then uh, it goes on and on and on. And uh, today, actually, you make waxes and then you crack those. So that's a, that's a fairly elaborate process. And it would be wonderful if we could find a way to stop at uh, C8, right, or C10. Uh, for the alcohols, it's a little different because the reaction conditions are different, but also because you have the oxygenates, and that, that helps a little. But still, we do make not just C2s. We do make, make higher ones, but not, but not as a, in, uh, in fish and crops. So, something that we Yeah, no. it, it's all, it, it, it's not, you know, inability, it's just a, a slightly smaller ability. Last question. Yeah. So in this chemistry, a lot uh -huh. of the selectivity is probably governed by the actual conditions uh, of the reactants, uh, relative uh, pressures, things like that. Do your calculations take in that into account? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the selectivity is given by the activation barriers. But you can, you can, by changing the reaction conditions, you can play that. But in the end, it's very, very difficult to play up against. If, if you have one barrier much higher than the other, then uh, that's very, very hard to, to, to get by. The, the way you usually do that is by increasing the temperature such that these differences are not much larger, but then the best you can get is 50%, right? So it's, it's, it's not really where you want to go. So the only way forward is to get something that has a 
considerably lower barrier for the route you want than for the route you don't want. You, you cannot engineer your way out of that, I'm afraid. Okay, uh, so with that, we'll wrap up this uh, technical session. Please join me in thanking Jens and all of our speakers.